morning. Welcome to our services. We've got quite a few visitors again with us this morning. We send a warm welcome out to you all as well. Uh, we've got a wonderful crowd. You guys keep inviting friends. We're going to open the uh, old club up again. Amen. Amen. That's good. And uh, just what a joy it is to be in God's house this morning. Amen. How many of you just to be here? The Lord's blessed us. We've had some good songs. And uh, I hope He can continue to do His part and use me to have a good service. Amen. Amen. Uh, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. I've got a few announcements that I'll go through. I think Brother Mike went through those. Uh, one of them is the um, back to school celebration. Diane, you want to give us an update on that? We do realize that there's parent teacher meet and greets on Thursday, so there's been just a little bit of a change. We are leaving here at 5 30, like it says in the bulletin, but if you can't be here at 5 30, just meet us up at the bowling alley. Don't feel like you can't come when you're done, whatever you're doing. And we've decided not to eat the pizza at Mom and Mia's. We're just going to have pizza there and drinks and snacks, so it's not like you're missing dinner. That'll be there when you get there, also. And also, for anyone that's going on the bus trip to see Esther, the balance of the the rest of your money is due so I can get our seat placed. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate you all heading that up. So we got a, a good number on the sign-up sheet. Make sure if you're uh, if you're going bowling, let us know so we have enough pizza to feed everybody. Uh, nothing worse than getting a group together and not having enough food for everybody. Everybody gets grouchy. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, the Does more everybody know, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, Does everybody fine. know where the bowling alley is in, in Shenandoah? It used to be called the Shenandoah T-Bowl Lanes. It's up there beside the Rudy's Diner. Beside 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 Rudy's if anybody needs directions, just reach out let us know. It's right on 340, right there beside Rudy Diner. So. The next one in the list is uh, next Sunday. Uh, we're going to have a special prayer for all the teachers, the school staff, and the students uh, that are heading back to school. I realize that the uh, teachers have already made it back, but uh, we're just going to uh, bring the kids and the teachers and the staff up front here. And the, myself and the deacons are going to have a special prayer and uh, ask that the Lord would bless them and have a, a great school year this year. And then uh, we're planning the baptism uh, after the uh, picnic on September the 5th. I've got a few to baptize. If you're interested in getting baptized, please let me know. Uh, the only requirement there is that you know the Lord is your Savior. And I'll be glad to baptize you. Uh, I had a young man uh, approach me this morning, and he said, Pastor, I've been thinking about it. And uh, he said, I want to be baptized. And before I could even ask him, he said, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. And boy, I'm about to cry back there in the nursery this morning. Amen? Amen. And that's what it's all about. So we're excited. We'll have our whole service up there at Lake Arrowhead. I think it's at the Lions Club Shelter. And uh, that will start at normal time, 11 o'clock. We'll have our preaching service. Uh, Ma, Julie's going to come and sing some songs for us. Uh, we'll share a meal together. And then we'll have the baptism. So I'm excited. And I'm looking forward to that. Amen? Amen. Did I miss any other announcements this morning? Oh, that's right. Grace is back here waiting at me. That's right. Heather Fultz has graciously uh, accepted and willing to uh, take on the task of having a Ladies Fellowship Bible study. And I'm excited about that. It's something we've been praying about. So today, right after the service, she'd like to meet with the ladies uh, to talk about the curriculum that they'll use and get a head count so we'll have enough materials and decide what day and how often that you guys want to meet. So. I'm excited about that. So all the ladies interested in ladies' fellowship, I would encourage you to stay today just briefly after uh, our worship service. Anything else? Everybody got to keep me straight. Amen. Well, this morning, I want you to turn, if you haven't already, to Genesis chapter 5. And I'm just going to read to you three verses today from Genesis chapter 5. And uh, I'm going to preach to you a message I've entitled, And He Died. And you probably think, what a strange topic and what a... What a topic for a sermon this morning. I didn't come today to church to hear a, a funeral message. And uh, I pray that you, uh, when you leave, you'll know that that's not what it is. But I feel that it's a message um, that the Lord has given me, and a message that we need to hear. Uh, Genesis chapter 5, uh, verse number 3. It says, And Adam lived 138, or 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Let's pray together. Father, we do today, Lord, just thank you and praise you for all your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and privilege to be in your house this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the wonderful worship this morning, the, the songs that were sung, Lord, the, the congregational singing, Lord, the kids and the choir 
Uh, Lord, just what a blessing and uplifting to, to lift your name on high and to sing, Lord, praises to you. Father, as we gather together, I pray, Lord, that uh, we've come seeking the same thing. That we've come to seek a blessing, Lord, from you. And I pray, Lord, today that you would use this message. I pray, Lord, that you would just hide me, Lord, that you take the focus off me. Lord, that you put the, the focus on you and your word and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, today there are many that have gathered today, and we ask the blessing on each and every family that's represented, each and every person. There's also many, Lord, that would like to be here, but for whatever the reason, they can't. We thank you, Lord, that you would send a blessing their way as well. Those today that are in the nurse home, those that are shut in, Lord, those, the ones that still have a heart, Lord, to, to hear your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be able to reach them as well. Today, Father, again, as I say to me, go through this message. I pray that all that's said and done continually, Lord, will bring honor and glory to you. I pray, Lord, that our Christian hearts would be challenged and encouraged, that, Lord, we might be able to leave this place today, that, that your word might not just fall on our deaf ears, that it would, would resonate, Lord, in our hearts, that we might be able to go out and, and be a brighter light to serve you. Amen. And I also pray, Lord, today, if there's anyone here that does not know Christ as his or her Savior, Lord, today, Lord, today would be an awesome day, a great day, yes. as we sung, Lord, a glorious day for them to accept Christ as their Savior. Right. Father, we thank you, Lord, we praise you. And we look forward, Lord, to your coming. We look forward, Lord, to that glorious day. We'll ask it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Genesis chapter 5, by the way of introduction, if you've read Genesis chapter 5, uh, it's basically a, a genealogy of Adam. It's basically a family tree. One of the good pastors that I follow and read a lot of material from has called it uh, Adam's family cemetery as he walks through and sees all these things. And if you can tell where I've gathered up my title from, it is the words, and he died, which is found uh, in many places throughout Genesis chapter 5. And as I've told you, I don't want today's message to be morbid. I don't want it to be sad. I don't want you to think about those things, even though many times when we hear the word uh, died or dying or death, it certainly brings sadness to our hearts and sorrow and grief. And I'm not uh, taking away from that at all. But as I studied and prepared for this message last Sunday morning during Sunday school, the, the question was asked to me about Enoch and who was Enoch. Was it, was it uh, Noah's father? And, uh, you know, I said, no, I don't think so. I said, I think Methuselah was Noah's father, but I was wrong too. The pastor was wrong. The pastor don't have all the answers many times. Uh, but it, it tells us here uh, that Lamech was uh, Noah's father, Methuselah was his grandfather, and Enoch would have been his great-grandfather. As I read these verses and read down through this genealogy of Adam, the Lord uh, spoke to my heart, and I thought about my life, and I thought about the time that I've been here, 42 and a half years, and uh, one of the old pastors that I used to sit underneath of, he said one time, he don't count half years, he said, I'm, uh, I think at that time he was like 86, he said, I'm 86, he said, I won't be 87 until such and such a day, he said, don't call me 80, 86 and a half. But uh, I thought about my life, and as I pondered over the things that we've seen and the things that we've done and the things that we've gone through, and it made me think about what we'll leave behind. And I can tell you just by the way of introduction, I don't want to go into my points already, but uh, we're not going to leave, uh, we're going to leave a lot behind material things. But there's a lot more that we can leave behind that are far more valuable than material things, that are far more valuable than possessions. We look at these verses, and you can see this statement, and he died. I want to go through just a few of them. Of course, I've already read verse number 5, where it says that Adam uh, lived for 930 years, and the Bible says that he died. In verse number 11, we see a man by the name of Enos. Uh, and it says, and all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. I'll pick on Nevin just a little bit. And if anybody's here named Enos, I apologize to you. But Nevin fusses about his name sometimes. I, I could have named you Enos. Uh, from, from the so you can thank me. You can thank me later that I didn't choose that. Amen. But in, and then again, in verse number 14, we see the man uh, by the name of Canaan. He says that he were 910 years in the same thing, and he died. In verse number 24, uh, we see a man by the name of Enoch. And there's a difference here. And Enoch, and I'll get back to that in, in just a minute, but skip down to 27. We see this man that I told you, Methuselah, the oldest recorded man to live in the Bible. It said, all the days of Methuselah 
for 969 years, and he died. And then uh, in verse 21 through 24, we see the contrast. There's only two men in the Bible that didn't have to die, and they are Enoch and Elijah. And in verse 21, it says, Enoch lived 60 and five years, and he begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and the Bible says he was not, for God took him. God took him. God called him out of this world alive. He did not have to go through death. But friends, I can tell you that you and I are not going to have that luxury. We are either going to leave this world by death or we're going to leave by an event called the rapture. I prefer the, I, I prefer the second. I would pray that the Lord would come quickly and that he would take us out in the rapture. But all of us today uh, will have to leave this world. Now, now, hold on. I told you I'm not going to be sad and morbid about it. I think there's a blessing in this that we can see as we go through these verses today. And as I said, this is Adam's family tree. This is his family cemetery. Now, I'll have a confession to you to make as your pastor. Uh, I'll have a little uh, fascination with cemeteries. And uh, you can call me morbid, you can call me weird. I'll explain it to you here in a minute. I think it goes back to my childhood. My parents had a, a contract where we, they mowed uh, cemeteries. And I spent some time in the cemetery when I was a young kid mowing and weeding and helping out. And uh, later in life, Rachel and I entered into a business deal, a business venture, and uh, we sold and installed uh, cemetery headstones. So it's kind of in, in my blood. And uh, my kids herself, when they were little, kind of grew up in the cemetery. I would take them with me when we would go measure and mark things off and uh, talk about things. And just uh, a few months back when we went to uh, Pennsylvania to have the services for Brother uh, Dick Brim, uh, I made a comment about how nice the cemetery was. And uh, Nevin and Ella was with me, and they said, Dad, you're right, this is very nice. I thought, man, I've rubbed off on them a little bit. But they had monuments and things in this cemetery that the man told me was uh, $250,000. It was amazing. But again, uh, those are things that will be left behind this world. It doesn't matter if they're $250 or $250,000, they'll be left behind. A little story about uh, me and the kids and uh, rubbing off on them when I was uh, in this cemetery business. Uh, we had sold a monument over in Fort Valley. And so Nevin was little. Uh, he could walk, but he couldn't walk for long distances. But we left out of the house, or, and we were going to go measure up some things. And lo and behold, we got to Fort Valley, and we ran out of gas. <laughs> Somebody forgot to put gas in the vehicle. I won't name any names. <laughs> Somebody don't like to pump gas and runs it down as empty as it can get. It's not good for your vehicle. Don't let it get down below half the tank because all that dirt circulates through. Anyway, that, that's, that's extra. It doesn't cost you anything. It's part of the message. But I ran out of gas. And so I put Devin up on my shoulders and we started walking. If you're familiar with Fort Valley, there's only one little gas station and country store over in Fort Valley. And I thought, man, this is going to be a long day. I'm going to walk forever. <coughs> Well, we didn't walk very far, and somebody was gracious enough to pick us up. I still believe the Lord had Nevin with me that day because he knew I was going to run out of gas. If I wouldn't have had Nevin with me, somebody probably wouldn't have picked me up. They'd probably say, look at that weirdo. I'm not going to pick him up. <laughs> Amen? But they picked me up and went and got gas. So long story short, you know, when you go to a cemetery, don't think about it as, a, uh, as an awkward place. It's really a, a, a hallowed place, a place that you can can pause and think, and, and I thought about these things, and I said, you know, the kids sometimes will say, well, you know, what goes on after we die? What happens after we die? The Bible's clear, and it tells us that if we're absent from the body, we're present from the Lord. Amen. And in a cemetery, you may have heard the expression this, that uh, here lies the shell, but uh, none is gone. And literally, if we're saved, uh, the cemetery is no more than a holy place for someone's body. That's all it is. And we think about it as so much more. But today, as I go on, I'll get through my introduction here. Uh, in Genesis 5, there's so much more than we can look at besides this statement as, and he died. And I want to look at these things because every word of God is important that we should study, that we can glean from. I'm not sure about you, but all throughout the Bible, there's a lot of genealogy. And there's a lot of uh, family trees. And many times the names are hard to pronounce, and many times we just kind of skip right on through them. But I can tell you, God has them there for a purpose. They're there for us uh, to speak to our hearts just the way the other words, just the way that John 3.16 that Brother Mike read this morning does. 
And I, I want to give you a few points that I found from Genesis chapter 5 that kind of spoke to my heart and can see to us that there's much more than we can say in that expression, and he died. The first one is this, that we all have an appointed time. Y'all mind if I take my coat off this morning? I'm still hot. We all have an appointed time. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 27 tells us that. Uh, it says that uh, it's appointed once a uh, man to die, and after that, the judgment. We all have an appointed time. Now, some of these men that I've read to you, man, they lived to be a ripe old age. Methuselah was 969 years. He was 969 years, but he was 187 years old when he had his son, Laman, who would be Noah's father. Can you imagine that? You know, I wake up now, I told you I've been here on this earth 42 and a half years, and, and uh, each day it seems like I get a new ache and a pain, or uh, something goes, goes wrong or goes bad. I believe it's because instead of me growing up, I've been growing out, and that attributes to some of these aches and pains. But anyway, can you imagine uh, having a child in that, in that age? And people say, well, Pastor, why did they, did they live to be such an old age in the Old Testament? Well, I believe that many of these folks are uh, have the uh, genes, not just the genealogy, but the genes of Adam. In. And when God created Adam, he created Adam to live eternally. He wanted Adam to dwell in the garden and to live eternally. But the curse of Adam, the curse of sin, is the reason why that people's lives have been shortened. It's the reason why that uh, sickness and, and things enter into our body. But today, uh, all of us have an appointment. We're all born, and when we're born, physically, that process of death starts. Whether you want to admit it or not, that process of death starts. To many of us, that don't give you the warm and fuzzies. It kind of gives you the, the cold chills. And I know you keep saying, well, Pastor, you said this wasn't going to be morbid. Well, hold on. I, I promise you we'll get to the good stuff. But all of us have an appointment. And one day... Uh, my kids don't want to hear this, but they're going to say that uh, if the rapture doesn't take place, that uh, Joshua part of that lived X amount of years, and it's going to say that he died. But I pray that it's so much more that can be said than that. It's so much more to our lives that can be said than that. We have appointments that we need to keep, and we have appointments that we are scheduling and ready for. I can tell you this appointment that the Bible says is appointed man wants to die, you can't schedule it. You can't make it fix your schedule. You can't call up to the doctor and say, oh, well, I, I can't come on that day. Do you have anything later in the day? Do you have anything later in the week? I uh, can't call the dentist and, and say, I need to reschedule because uh, uh, make up some kind of excuse that you had to reschedule literally because you forgot about the appointment. Uh, you can call and make an appointment to get your car serviced, worked on, all kinds of appointments. We plan vacations. Uh, my family's already planning a vacation for next year. I haven't recovered uh, physically, financially, or spiritually from the first one, uh, from this one, but they're already planning the next one. So, but anyhow, we, you see where I'm going? We can, we can uh, plan for a lot of things, but we can't plan for this appointment that the Lord has for us. We can be ready, but we cannot plan. We can be prepared. The Bible tells us uh, in the book of Romans, it says that the wages of sin is what? It's death. It means that word death there means eternal separation from God. There's where you should have sadness. There's where we should have grief and sorrow in our hearts when we hear that word. Romans 6 23, for the wages of sin is death. It's death. It's eternal separation from God. But God loves us enough that he goes on. He says but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All of us this morning I can tell you we have an appointment. Adam had an appointment. Seth had an appointment. Methuselah had an appointment. Enos had an appointment. Noah had an appointment. All these men had an appointment. Today, we can't schedule it, but I can tell you, you can be ready for it. I pray that all of you here today are ready. I pray that you've accepted Christ as your Savior, that you've received that free gift of salvation. And then secondly, we will all leave something behind. We'll all leave something behind. As I told you before, we're not going to take anything out of this world with us. We're not going to take one penny. We're not going to take one acre, one car, one possession, uh, anything. I share it with the folks. I think it was Sunday night or Wednesday night. Uh, there's a verse that comes to my mind. I know a lot of farmers in the community, and uh, we talk and do things, and there's a verse that says the, cat, the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And I said that he's just left us here to be caretakers of them. They're not really ours anyway. They're his. 
the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But listen to us today, we're not going to take any of it with us. Brother Mike, I've heard you say that you've never seen a, a U-Haul being towed behind the hearse. And uh, that's true. You don't. Uh, we're not going to take uh, anything out of this world with, with us. We're going to leave a lot behind. We're going to leave a lot of physical things behind. A lot of things of value. I'm going to get a little bit personal today with this message as well. But you all know that I've struggled over the last two years for, with many things. And, and some of those things was lose my parents within a year of each other. And my father, uh, he was prepared to go. He knew the Lord as his Savior. And uh, his illness uh, prepared us for his leading. We knew that uh, there was no hope, there was no cure for him to be physically healed. And we knew that he'd already been spiritually healed. And we knew that his time uh, on this earth was coming to a close. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul when he told young Timothy, he says that, um, he said, the time of my departure is near. He said, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. He said, I finished my course. And he said, henceforth laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, not only to me, but all, to all those that love his appearing. It reminded me of that. And what I'm getting to here today is this. When my dad got his diagnosis, uh, me and him was together in the room. It was just me and him. And um, he knew how bad it was. And uh, I knew how bad it was too. But I could just see the look on my dad's face that he didn't want anybody else to know how bad it was except for me and him. And I followed the doctor out in the hallway and I said, well, really, what is it? What is it? He said, well, your dad has a 90% chance that he'll be gone in three years. And he was gone in less than seven months. And we prepared for that. We prepared for that day to come. But when it came, it was hard. And it, it reality set in for me is what I'm getting to is with these earthly possessions my parents never had a whole lot. We didn't have to worry about a multi-million dollar estate to settle. But one thing that my dad had in love was guns. And uh, one day he called me and Nevin to the house and uh, he had an Ethica shotgun that my mother had bought him for a wedding present when they got married in the, in the early 60s. And he told me, he said, Josh, go to the gun cabin and get that shotgun that your mom got me. I want you to have it and I want it to be Nevin's when you feel like he's ready to have it. And boy, it hit me hard then. I knew then. I knew then that Dad was making his, getting preparations ready to leave this world. I knew that he knew he couldn't leave those things behind. He wasn't taking them with him, but he wanted us to have them. And I knew that he was getting ready. But the one thing that we can leave behind is, is these two things. Number one, or I guess part A of my first point would be this, our heritage. Our heritage. We can leave behind our heritage. The word heritage, if you wanted to give a biblical definition of heritage, would be something that's passed to somebody that we possess, something else. We think about physical things. We think about that gun that I shared to you that my father gave to me. But that's not what we need to worry about. We need to worry about the spiritual heritage that we can leave to our family and to our friends. On my parents' headstone, uh, when Dad passed away, we... Mom and I pondered on what to put on the back of it. And I come across Psalm 127.3. And it says, Lo, children are a heritage unto the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And I thought, what would be my parents' heritage? What would they want to be known for, their kids? Their prized possession, that other than salvation was their kids. And that's what we put on the back of it. But today, I'll ask you a question. What would your heritage be? Would it be a, a spiritual heritage? Or would you have family to fight and fuss over the millions of dollars that, uh, that you leave behind? I've got a quick solution for that. If you don't want your family to, to fight and fuss over, just go ahead and send it to Rachel and I. And we'll give we'll you out. We'll take care of it for you. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. Everybody said all the preachers want everybody's money for you. But look, what would it be? And I, I mentioned to you that uh, what we put on the back of my parents' headstone, what would be your epitaph if you had to choose it, if you were able to choose it? Some of you may have already chosen. I'm not sure. But one of the uh, pastors that I followed a lot and was an influence on me, and I never met him in person, but I listened to a lot of his tapes and to a lot of his messages, was uh, Bobby Robertson. Bobby Robertson was an uh, old-time uh, fundamental Baptist preacher from North Carolina, and he preached all the way up pretty much till he died in his 80s. 
And on his headstone, his epitaph of these words, it says, waiting on the rapture. That's what I told you earlier, that, 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 the, that the shell is there, the, the nut is gone, he's just waiting on, the body's just waiting on the rapture to take place, where God will open up those graves. Some others here that I've noted for my message this morning is this, uh, Merv Griffin. Now, a lot of younger, younger folks here won't understand what I'm talking about. But on his headstone, it says, I will not be right back after this message. <laughs> and uh, so I thought that was pretty amusing. Uh, there's some that are pretty sad. There was one that somebody stumbled across and said that on there, and I don't know who this person was, but said these were the words that said, man, it's dark down here. And I thought, what, what a sad, sad epitaph to leave on a headstone. Because I can tell you, as I said, the, the soul and the spirit are not in the darkness. They're in the presence of God if you're saved. And then Martin Luther King, uh, on his tombstone, what we all know him for was these words, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. That's what's on his. He was. He was free at last. And then Thomas Jefferson listened to this, and there may be uh, someone here that knows the answer to this. I don't. But on the back of his headstone, it says, Here was buried Thomas Jefferson author of the Declaration of American Independence of the Statue of Virginia for Religious Freedom and the father of the University of Virginia. And I wonder if that past tense here was, was because him too also knew that it was just a, a, temporary, a temporary space for his body, that one day uh, out of that grave uh, bodies will rise. But you can see where I'm going with this. We all leave behind a heritage. We can pass it on to our kids, to our grandkids. You might not be here today and say, well, Pastor, I don't have kids. I don't have grandkids. You can still leave a heritage. We all have an influence on somebody, and we should leave them a good, godly heritage. I would encourage you today to, to evaluate your life and look back as you, as you look back through your family and say, what kind of heritage am I going to leave to my family? I'm not worried about the 401K. I'm not worried about the car. I'm not worried about the house. I'm not worried about the estate. I'm worried about what kind of good godly heritage that I can leave for my family. And I pray that that would be my prayer. If the Lord would take me today, that I would leave a good godly heritage for my family, that they would continue on. That if something would happen, that I would go out into eternity today, that they would be next week sitting right here on this bench singing the song, Glorious Day, lifting praises to the Lord. And then uh, the second thing, or I guess part B of my first uh, point would be this. We leave behind our testimony. All of us have a testimony, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And you might say, well, Pastor, my family's heritage is not the best. If someone looks at me, they're going to say that, well, that family's rough. And I can tell you, we have a tendency to do that here in Page County. We have a tendency many times to point a finger of blame, to point a finger to, to someone. When we need to remember that, you know, we point one finger, we got these other ones pointing right back at us. But I can tell you, Today, your testimony can change your heritage. You can be the one to turn the ship. You can be the one to turn the family in the right direction if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and live for Him. Your testimony beyond your salvation is one of the most precious things that you'll have. But I can tell you, it can be ruined, it can be tarnished in just a minute. And Satan, the enemy, the adversary, he, that's what he wants. He wants to ruin your testimony. He don't want you to leave a godly heritage. Now, I told you that I was going to get personal this morning and talk about uh, my parents and, and the experiences that I had. My parents' testimony, literally, I believe, was shaped in their last few years of their lives. They left a, a good heritage for us. They left a, a, a good way for us to see that we could treat each other and love one another. And my mother uh, would see the best in anybody. And I pray daily, many times, that I could be more like her that I could see the best in everybody. I would be critical, especially sometimes of, fa of family members. And mom would soon remind me that uh, I could be in that same situation. And I pray that, uh, that that would continue in my life. But what I'm saying is I think their testimony was shaped in the later part of their life as they went through the health problems that they had, that they truly did put their faith and trust in the Lord. To, that they, they didn't know what the outcome was going to be, but they knew who held the outcome. And uh, they grew in the Lord in those uh, last few years. But it's, impo it's possible for us that our testimony could, could be uh, elaborate. I could stand before you today and, and share my testimony for you. I could probably give you a whole sermon and a whole message about it. 
how that the Lord saved me at a young age, how I veered away. But many people have a, a longer testimony. Many people have a different testimony. I'm not bragging today, but uh, I've never been uh, addicted to alcohol, never been hooked on drugs. The reason why is because God, uh, I put made right decisions, but I certainly could have made the wrong decisions. I can't stand here and give those elaborate testimonies, but some of you may be able to. Share those things with people that they might be an encouragement to others who feel like they have no hope. God is always worthy of our praise, Amen. and that's why he's given us our testimony. Today, I would say this, if I was going to tell you what I want my testimony to be is this, that I want to live as a Christian, and I want to die as a Christian. And I think that would be a good testimony for all of us to have, that we could live or we could die as a Christian. And then, point three is this, every day matters. Every day matters. Now, as I told you in chapter 5, man, these folks had a, a eight to 900 years to leave behind a testimony, to leave behind a heritage. You and I are not that, uh, we're not afforded that luxury. We're not going to live to be the ripe old age of 969 years. I can promise you that. I'm not being a prophet. I'm not being a, a physician, but I can tell you none of us here today are going to live to be 969 years. That's why uh, the Lord has told us that we need to be uh, witnesses for him. We need to take his word to the uttermost part of the, of the earth. Every day matters. It matters when you wake up today. Think about it. What kind of influence am I going to have? What decision am I going to make today that would help me lead a godly heritage? What decision today am I going to make to help me uh, with my testimony? Every day matters. When I talk to young folks that are going to get married and um, Dylan and Caitlin could probably uh, share this with you as well. I give them a verse. And I tell them the Bible tells us, it says, Be ye angry not and sin not. And it says, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Meaning, don't go to bed mad at each other. Now, somebody didn't share that verse with Rachel before we got married. <laughs> because uh, it seems like, you know, uh, I'll always get myself in a little bit of trouble and I'm waiting for her to say, well, gosh, it was partly my fault. And I don't want to go to bed mad, but, boy, she's, she's good. She holds out for a long time. I finally, I just give in because I'm going to go to sleep. I'm like, Rachel, I'm sorry. I'm going to bed. <laughs> but I would encourage all of us that every day matters. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Tomorrow's not promised to any of us. We need to live life to the fullest. If you have someone that uh, you have a problem with, I would suggest that you approach that person and get it settled. At least get it settled on your part. I'm not telling you that the other person on the other end is going to uh, be as receptive to that. But don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't leave this world angry with somebody. And then we all have something to look to. We all have something to look to. I think all these men here that, uh, that the Lord talked about, many of them uh, have put their faith and trust in Him and, and served Him. Uh, we know that Enoch did. The Bible tells us there twice that he walked with God. And I believe that he must have walked as close to God as anybody on this earth has. That's why God decided he needed him. He's going to take him on uh, to glory without him dying. But we all have something to look to. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says that we are to look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. It says, for the joy that has set before him, he endured the cross despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he's there today, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and he's making intercession for us. Right. But I can tell you, we have that to look forward to if we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, going back to the family cemetery or to Adam's family tree, as if Adam would walk down through this family cemetery and look at all these men that were part of his uh, genealogy, part of the, the family that he had. And many of you can do the same thing. We can walk through it. And, then, and again, we can have joy knowing that if those family and friends have trusted Christ as their Savior, that really that's not their final resting place. We say that. And I, I try to make sure that I never say that at a service because especially the service of, of a Christian, it's not our final resting place. It's our temporary resting place. You know, as a pastor, one of the hardest things to do is to have a, a service, a memorial service or a funeral service for someone uh, that you do not know if they have a relationship with the Lord. Now, I don't have to know that person 
personally, if I know that their family or someone tells me that they've had a relationship with the Lord, it's still easier if I never had met them. But if I do not know their spiritual uh, situation, that's the hardest thing ever. And for us to walk through this family cemetery, it would be hard for us to, to see that. But we, we look to the one that is the author and finisher of our faith, the one that brought us into this world, the one that created us, uh, just like Adam was created in his image. Uh, and then it says he's also the finisher. He's the one that knows the appointed time. He's the one that can enable us to, to strengthen our heritage, to strengthen our testimony. One of the verses that's kind of been claimed for me is maybe my life verse or my verse that I've claimed over the last two years is this. If in this life we have hope, but we only have hope in Christ. Let me read that again. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Today I would encourage you that we put our faith and trust in Christ today. Amen. But there's much more to look forward to than today. We can look forward to eternity that God has prepared for us. And that's what Paul is saying here, that if he only had hope in Christ in this life, we would be of all men most miserable. But we can have uh, this faith, and we can have this hope in Christ. And then, uh, that's in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if you want to mark that down. But we all have that to look forward to, if we've accepted Christ as our Savior. Amen. Today, uh, for the believer, uh, this thing that I preached to you about, and he died, it, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. It's just literally a, a bridge over a river that we can't cross <coughs> on our own. It's a door that opens up to the other side. Jesus said he stands at the door and he knocks. He stands at the door and he knocks. And he's there today. He's knocking on your door. I pray today that all of you here have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that you know him as your personal Savior. If you don't, today would be no better day to get that settled. That's right. That you can say for sure that you know that no matter when your appointed time comes, that you have a home in heaven. And then... You might be here and say, well, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I am saved. I'm living for the Lord, but I want to do more to leave behind a godly heritage. I want to do more to have a, a stronger testimony. I want to reach more people for, for you. Today, I would encourage you to, to come to this altar and, and pray and ask God to do that, to strengthen your heritage and to give you a, a better testimony, or I should say a brighter testimony that you might be able to reach others for him. Susie, you want to come to the piano? I'm going to ask everybody this morning to bow their heads and close their eyes. Our Father, we do, Lord, just...